everybody uh, this is wonderful to be here today uh, on the platform of charchika the women's leadership forum of shri shri university and uh, the idea is to host conversations with very very inspiring women achievers women leaders entrepreneurs social entrepreneurs women who have made a difference in their community is in their countries and bring these inspiring stories so that a, a little seed of inspiration can uh, be uh, sown in our lives and today we have a fantastic and an incredible guest with us her name is naya sagi uh, naya is the ceo and founder of baby chakra she is the co-founder of the unicorn good glam group you know there are only 108 unicorns in india and she is the co-founder of one of them uh, she is a graduate of the harvard business school class of 2012 where she was a fulbright scholar a jn tata scholar she received a ba llb from national law school and prior to baby chakra she was a management consultant with mckinsey and at the bridge span group in boston where she worked extensively on uh, some of her areas which are her passion the passion of her life maternal and child health education um she's a trend setter in the in community based startup spaces and uh, so much so that she was invited to discuss community building with none other than mark zuckerberg and we are so happy that despite her really really busy schedule uh, naya agreed to do this conversation with all of us so that all university shri shri university students team members and everybody who is watching this interview live today uh, will get a chance to learn from her journey and therefore take a leaf out of her life and uh, apply it into our lives naya hearty hearty welcome to shri shri university uh, virtually we would have loved to host you in person but that stays for another day and uh, despite your schedule i know you are in the middle of many launches you agreed to do this conversation with us thank you very very much I mean Rajita this is an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be talking with you as you know I'm a big fan of yours uh so it is really my pleasure and I'm very excited about uh, our conversation for sure So Naya I just to share with you um uh, as i was sharing with you before our conversation that uh, in shish university have we have a women's leadership forum charchika where we host conversations like this also many events and activities in areas which are actually very close to your uh, to to your heart like uh, hygiene uh, mental physical hygiene and well being for women of different strata we are in a reasonably rural uh, surrounding so we bring women from all the nearby villages together also on menstrual hygiene and many other aspects we have done many many events and workshops uh, also part of our w20 partnership with the g20 we have hosted many events also on uh, issues of gynecological importance and all other uh, such topics and uh, i was sharing with you as an entrepreneur what is uh, what might excite you is that we have an incubator where uh, we have close to 125 startups today where 20% of them are by women founders so we are going to ask you some questions which will definitely um be of great help to them and we have a women's international network uh, where women who have done programs uh, offered by shish university are part of that network so all of them are watching you as as we speak today so thank you for doing this for us thank you so what should we jump in ha huh? absolutely i said i said what a privilege absolutely let's jump in and uh, because we are doing this virtually naya we wanted to also uh, uh, express our appreciation to you so the only way we can do this virtually is today there will be a tree planted in your name on shri shri university campus and uh, you can choose and tell us what type what 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 tree would you like it to be so we will choose that and plant it on your name and we will send you a photograph of that It's a wonderful gesture. Thank you so much. And it's a beautiful way to actually, you know, show appreciation because I think it's it's it's, it's great for everybody, the planet, for all of us, and it's a memory. Yeah. So you let us know what tree you would like it to be, and we will. Uh, we hope that we can find it and you know plant it in your name. Yeah. Done. <laughs> so. Um, Naya, I have known you for a bit, and I have always wondered. 
what your journey, you know, from where you started and where you are today. So from National Law School, then to do MBA from Harvard Business School, and then as a consultant in McKinsey, and then you started Baby Chakra, and now, you know, being a founder of a unicorn. Tell us about this journey of yours. I mean, where do I start, really? <laughs> but it's Start but from it's... the very beginning. No, so, you know, I, I'll, I'll start from, uh, and I've, I've shared this before, you know, Rajita, but I think um, we're such a function of the uh, environment we grew up in, right? Um, and I grew up in Calcutta. My mom was in the civil services in the IAS. She was a Bengal card officer, Punjabi, but Bengal card. So she literally picked up Bengali while she was, when she was posted to Bengal. We lived in districts for the most part of my very, very young years. And of course, Calcutta was when I did my, you know, started my schooling. So, and I think, uh, you know, there was always this conversation of how do you live a life of impact at a dining table, right? It was always that. And even in like the, the get togethers we had with my mother's friends or my father's friends or, you know, anything, it was all always about impact. Ki ek life hai, kaise, how do you leave, lead it fruitfully? You know, I think that stayed with me. So I went on to do law. Um, undergrad was National Law School, Bangalore. And, uh, you know, so far I faced an amazingly, I think, uh, it, it all going in some sense with some plan, not really well planned, but some plan in mind, right? Ki law se bhi impact aa sakta hai, you know, you can do human rights, humanitarian law. Um, and I think after that experience of law school, I think I realized how important, again, the environment you surround yourself is, right? Because the peer set I was surrounded by were some, among some of the most ambitious kids in the country. So, and also what I realized was there's not just one size that fits all, right? Because there were kids who were really respected for being great at quizzing or debating or mooting or athletics, right? So it wasn't only about having that academic excellence that we'd grown up hearing is like the norm uh, back in school. So I think that also shaped my experiences a lot. I think the most formative time though, however, was at law school when I stood to be university president um, and uh, I was going to be one of the very few women in the history of law school to stand for president. Um, and I remember till then life had been very equal, very equitable because, you know, school and all, like I was in a girl's school, no gender thing. Law school, first three years was fabulous. When I stood, there was a very, very popular boy who stood against me. And I remember getting messages on my Nokia 3310, you know, the little phone where you could play steak, right? That those times saying, you're a girl, you're presentable. Why don't you stand for vice president? Or step down. We don't want you. So a lot of like a lot of a very strange hate uh, based on my gender, which I had not anticipated. Before that, I stood for three years. I'd been class rep, done an amazing set of moods, etc. I had a bunch of friends. Was very well known. And I remember making a decision, saying, "Should I actually be VP? You know, is this the right decision for me?" And at that point in time, one of my closest friends uh, and my mother. So Kamya and my mom both called me and said, no, you are going to stand for president. That is your aspiration. And I said, yes, I do. This is what I want to do. This is what I will do. And I stood for president. And I still remember when I was giving my speech, people were booing in the back, right? But eventually when they did the votes, I won. Wow. So I think that stayed with me that if you want something badly enough, right? And if it comes under, say, you have to fight for it, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will, maybe uninformed people, but regardless, like even people closest to you may judge you on gender. It does not mean you judge yourself as less mm -hmm. based on your gender. So anyway, that's been the broader formative story. I can go on and on. You know, McKinsey happened, healthcare happened, I went on to business school, you know, and in business school learned a lot about how amazing business models were being formed using the power of technology. And I was looking at India, you know, data, digital device democracy was happening at scale. So decided to come back to India and build our baby chakra. Okay, why? So again, that goes back to the formative experiences, right? Uh, McKinsey was one such. Um, I was working with the maternal and child health strategy for the Gates Foundation. Had a chance to work extensively in, you know, in the villages and public health and, uh, you know, PHCs um, with governments, I you know, understanding how the Ministry of Women and Child works, how the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare works. And of course, more importantly, with communities. I was working with communities of mothers uh, on the ground. And what I realized was there was such a big power around having a community of care around you. Because the communities, I mean, in the villages we saw doing the best, 
it was where mothers were actually sharing best practices with each other in a non-judgmental setting, right? On things like breastfeeding, pregnancy care. The entire family was involved in the care protocol, as well as, of course, the healthcare workers were very involved in monitoring and measuring. Mm. Right? So that's when I, for the first time, saw the power of community in a very, frankly, still to be fixed system and a very mm. fragmented system of care. I think that stayed with me. And I, I think what happened was my sister became pregnant around the same time when I was in Harvard and I saw her go through that journey. And I was like, well, even in urban India, mm. right? Forget, I mean, the, forget rural, even in urban India, there is so much information asymmetry. There's so much lack of confidence when one becomes a mother. Uh, and there's such a lack of just that societal support, right? Because we all live in nuclear families today. How do we replicate that digitally? Mm. Uh, that was the seed of the thought. And it was, you know, you know, Rajita, it is like this. And I know you're similar, right? You know, when you want to do something, you just have to do it. Like you can't, you can't sleep. You can't, you can't breathe. You have to get down and do it, right? So literally I remember in Boston sitting and, you know, I used to read a lot of your story. Keep on telling Shraddha, I used to read a lot of your story then to see Kya Chal Rai India, may read the newspaper. It's not like there's so much like opportunity to make impact using digital, right? And I told Sandeep, my husband saying that, listen, we have to go back. And he's like, okay, but in a year, two years, or now we have to go back next week. We literally flipped a coin, decided on which city to move back to. Hmm. It turned out to be Bombay, which I'm very grateful for. Bombay has been a great city for me to build in. And that's it. That's how we went back. And that's how I went back. And that's how Baby Chakra started. Wow. Wow. Uh, Naya, in hindsight, so many things worked out, right? Uh, in that sense, they, you are here at this, this, this stage of your life professionally. I'm first talking only professionally. And when you look back, the decision to came back worked out, the city worked out, even the president election worked out. Did you ever think uh, in your mind, Naya, uh, did you have a plan B or how, how does that work in your mind? Because in retrospect, when it has worked out, it, it seems you make it sound easy, but it must have not been, I reckon it might not have been that easy. Honestly, I do feel that we've all come from a place of privilege. You know, we had parents who were educated, who backed us, you know, regardless of our gender or maybe even more so because of our gender. Uh, I grew up in a family that where I saw my parents play a very, very positive role. I mean, they had an equal partnership in raising my sister and I. Um, you know, we went to amazing schools. So, you know, honestly, Rajita, yes, there were obviously hardships and there are lots of failures along the way. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but we, we, we're very fortunate. Mm. And I think it's important to also acknowledge that the base level of privilege that we all have, and if we don't build off it, mm. right, then who will? You know, when you have such opportunities and you have such a good, strong base level, I mean, it's for us to build off that, right? I mean, we can keep on saying, oh, I didn't have this, I didn't have that. Well, we had a lot, mm. right? That's one. I think the second piece is, I do want to talk a little bit about the failures, because I think too often we talk about success, success, success. And, you know, honestly, everything, first of all, in hindsight is 2020, as we all know. <laughs> it all seems to fit together. And I'm mm. a big, op you know, big optimist. So for me, every time there's a door that's shut, like, I think there's a whole, like, I don't know, like a bridge that opens. <laughs> so it's just like, but I was a very bad student in high school. You know, I, uh, I remember, like, everybody used to wonder what would happen to me uh, professionally, right? And I think what I learned over time was that what drive I'm a, I'm a creature of passion, right? And I'm a creature of purpose. So if I find my passion and purpose and something I, I find that adds, and of course the impact piece stays with me, right? If I find that, right, then I go all in. And when I go all in, I'm the best. I know that now. Wow. So I think that is what has happened to me, right? And I think, which is why I tell everybody that don't let anybody else define their journeys uh, or your journey for you because your journey is unique and the minute you find your passion your purpose and your reason for existence right that's when you find um, your calling and then no one can stop you there's only one of you if you find your calling you will win uh, but just get into it with like full single-minded determination 
very very powerful so you said you are a teacher of passion and purpose wow wow so i want to before i go into the next line of questions i want to ask you the story you told about standing for university president and where you were actively uh, sort of um, discouraged to do it what what was it what was in it in you at that time that made you of course you said your mom and some friends pushed you but there was some what was it inside you because you know today that is a big thing I'm seeing even in students uh, even in young faculty members that uh, sometimes the external environment uh, can become a, a, you know can become a discourager for you to otherwise do what you might have succeeded in doing so what 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 did you do or what inside you made you go through the course and I believe that all of us have a reservoir of strength mm -hmm. and a reservoir of self-belief. Right. Um, and when the going gets really tough, that's when you kind of dip into that reservoir. Um, so first of all, I think in our daily, day-to-day -day life, in our interactions with people, with family, in doing work that you believe in, right? One important thing is to constantly build on that reservoir of strength and that reservoir of self-belief. You know, because you may not realize it, but one little success, acknowledge it. Mm. Build it to yourself, right? And keep on building on your reservoir. It's like this tanky that you're building up, right? Mm. When you, when people believe you the least, you go back to the reservoir and dip into it. So mm. that's one piece, right? Which I've learned to practice over time. I think the second piece is if you really, really want something, you know, you just have to go for it. Mm. And you have to do it for yourself. You do not want to live a life of regret. Mm. I did not want to live a life of regret. I mean, it might seem so petty today, something so small. Yeah, you know, student body, union, president. It does not matter in the broader scheme of things in life, right? None of this matters, honestly. But if I think back and I, and I, that moment I said, if I don't do this, will I regret it? And my answer to myself was, yes, I will. Because I want to do it. I believe I'm worthy of it. I deserve it. I will do it. Right. So I don't, I don't fundamentally believe in leading a life of regret as well. Mm. I think that also helps me make some decisions for myself. Wow. Very well said. And it's very powerful because especially I'm seeing Danya uh, uh, coming out of COVID where all of us got so um, brutally engulfed by this global phenomena. A lot of minds have uh, become weaker. Uh, given what we went through, the circumstances, the challenges we faced. So I think this is so powerful what you're saying. And I think it is really, really, um, I, I, I'm sure it'll resonate with a lot of our young students. So Naya, this is what you experienced during this first incident. Maybe you experienced this sort of discrimination or active uh, sort of, uh, you know, lobbying against you. How has it been in your journey as an entrepreneur? Have you faced that? Um, uh, you know, a, a, as a woman entrepreneur, uh, as a founder, as a, you know, you introduced concepts which were potentially quite new to the country. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, Rajita, I think um, many, many entrepreneurs who are women have probably faced and been in conversations where they're either sidelined or not uh, acknowledged as serious entrepreneurs, you know, because... Mm -hmm. I mean, people consider the burden of all the personal mm. stuff to be extremely heavy on their heads alone. And I don't think I'm alone in that. I, there are two things, however. One is that, uh, and I learned this from someone I was interviewing for my mompreneur uh, podcast recently, uh, Nilu. Nilu Khatri, she's a co-founder of Akasa Air. Very, very powerful, very inspirational personality and very simple, which I love. Uh, but what she said really resonated with me because I really believe in that is that in your journey of life, there will be, you know, many naysayers and many, many people who will support you. Yeah. You know, many times you only focus on the naysayers. Yeah. But look at all the people who are supporting you in that journey. Yeah. Right? Can you like use that to propel you forward? And I think that's a very powerful way because it really resonates with the way I have lived my life. Right. Every time I found a naysayer, I've said, okay, fine. Do I need to spend time trying to convince you? Or is it better if I find the 10 other positive folks who will propel us all in our journeys, right? Maybe. You have to keep on trading off. You have like such limited time in life. You yeah. have, you know, so you might have a little trade off and say, okay, who do I really want to spend time with? 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I really want to have as part of my mission. So I think that's one piece that really is extremely practical and very, very valuable advice to switch thoda sa your way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the second piece to it is that, um, you know, when you, when you do come across a situation of, let's say, bias that is maybe unconscious or consciously, people are a lot more tuned today, fortunately. So maybe it's unconscious, it still needs to be changed, right? I think it's important to call it out gently, but firmly. Because, you know, when you reach a position of leadership, like you have Rajata, or like, you know, today I'm aspiring to, or like lots of other women around us are aspiring to, right? Or have reached. If we don't set it right, if we don't change that narrative, right? Then someone younger, more vulnerable will face the same situation yeah so i think it's extremely important and that's something i take on myself today to if i'm if, if i'm ever in a situation i call out stuff and it need not be like fighting against the world it could be a very gentle nudge or a very gentle one on one conversation right um and you know the good thing is nothing succeeds like success yeah so the same people who probably had a few opinions of me early on in my journey right are more amenable to listening to me today because they feel i've come a certain way so then what i end up doing is i use my voice today as much as possible to ensure that this change can happen at least in my environment so i think these are the two things i hold uh, <laughs> i stick to very But, well said and what you said about call- calling out there is this famous story of also the late queen elizabeth uh saying i think to winston churchill that the late winston churchill that don't look at me as my gender but as my position and i think uh, that uh, is a is a big uh, message and though it might be easy sometimes or difficult sometimes i think you rightly said that we all need to do it at whichever level uh, we are at in our life personally and professionally yeah very very well said i also do i have a small like you said look at the um, the yes more than the no uh, there is a small uh, tip i always also share that whenever such things happen in life every night write down what worked today and you know compared to what didn't work and you will always see that what worked the list mostly is longer than what didn't work and i think that's where it also adds to the idea you said of building your own reservoir because i think that keeps you know building your own inner strength for yourself. Oh this is very well said. Now yeah I want to come a little bit to a personal point. You are yourself a mom, a wife, you know, you play many roles. I have seen your daughter. I mean she's a little cuddly doll. Uh I sometimes wonder about young moms, how do you even leave the kids home to get out to work? You know, it, it is a big big decision of life and uh, you know how how are you managing it through covid uh, through le- you know you are leading a large unicorn it's no mean responsibility by any count how do you manage it the 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 balance of wanting to control everything versus knowing when to let go and you know let it be tell us about that because so many young mums today especially again after covid uh, have left professional careers because life has just become too overwhelming for them through this period and they have not yet come out in fact mckinsey has themselves produced a lot of material where they're talking about really scary uh, sounding uh, figures but they are the truth so talk to us about that and what tips you you can share with others like you so you know uh, and just on that and i couldn't uh, resonate more with you right on how important a mandate it is for all of us to bring mums to meet their peak potential whatever it might be right um and their aspiration whatever it might be in fact uh, i was sharing with you earlier right rajita we've started this podcast called mompreneur legends where we are interviewing top leaders top entrepreneurs who happen to be mums and the whole idea is to bring out a lot of these practical situations versus making it more theory based right because everybody has gone through different journeys like i mentioned neelu right she's gone she's a single mother you know uh, so she's raised two boys and now she's a co-founder of akasha air i mean that's a, she was in the iaf earlier wing commander what a story right practical situations practical learnings there we recently interviewed fay who's a journalist as you know an award winning journalist right and her journey through you know and you'll obviously see the podcast you'll know more about those journeys but practical situations on how she she's a one and a half year old son neil right i mean and she's building her new company beetroot out 
right? So very, very practical instances. Now, to answer your question directly, how do I do it? I do it, um, you, you know, I think it, if I just sort of systemize a little bit, right? Three things work for me. One is I am not, I, I'm, I'm actually quite a perfectionist, but I've learned to let go of being that, right? Because eventually you have to make a trade-off, right? If you want things to grow, and if you want to grow, do you want to, it's all about like saying that, do you want to um, wait that extra time? And will you lose that opportunity waiting to be perfect? Or do you want to just make use of that opportunity? And then, you know, maybe you're 80% there, right? And you're okay with that. So at home and in, and at work, I've, I've learned to stop being a perfectionist. So, you know, maybe the house is a bit messy. Maybe Arya's hair is whatever. Maybe Arya's missed one play date or missed some class. It's okay, you know live and let live. Same with work, right? I mean, I think, of course, the critical stuff needs to go really well. But, you know, as, as the team knows what they're doing, they're professionals, they know how to handle these situations, right? So you have to learn, start learning to trust the team and know that they're doing the best that they can in whatever circumstances they are in. So I think that whole perfectionist piece, like holding on and micromanaging certainly is something I've learned to do away with. And I think that's got me also a lot of peace and time to do other stuff that I need to do to move business forward, to move family forward, right? The second thing I think is, of course, having an amazing, amazing team at home and at work. Uh, my husband and I are very, very equal partners um, and I would not have it any other way, right? Um, and more importantly, I think, I know there's a lot of pressure women feel when they're asking, when they feel they have to ask something. But, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get anyway. So it's worthwhile having that conversation in a very non-confrontational, in a very non-judgmental way and lay out very practical steps where you think that work can actually be equally allocated. It might be a school pickup or it might be, um, you know, ensuring that the groceries come and, you know, it, it, the simpler, it, it like you, you can make it very simple, very, very equal. And I think that just takes off a big burden from daily living because daily living is a lot of work, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's important to have those conversations and honestly you know today's I feel like the men are today also changing right yeah. because they're no longer like they understand I mean they're not living in a uh, you know living in a cave right they're also evolved human beings and they they want to be part of the family they want to be a father they want to be a husband they want to be a caregiver so I think it's important for the for the spouses to basically give them that opportunity and to tell them that you have to do it. I mean, this is part of who you are, right? Yeah. Um, and I think the third piece is, uh, you know, just get all the help you can whenever you need it. The other day, I have an amazing nanny, but she had to go for some urgent chore. And, you know, I had to go for some urgent meetings, I was meeting the, the government for something. And Arya would have been alone at home. So I just literally picked up the phone, figured out some neighbor, you know, who has a small child. I mean, our children play together. She was super amazing. Like I dropped Arya off there. Um, you know, then the stove also conked off on the same day, same morning, right? And of course, Sandeep was trying to figure out if he could get an alternative stove. But in the meantime, I was like, okay, but food has to be fair to everybody at home. So then I request the same neighbor to like ensure that we could get some food extra made for ourselves. But of course, you give back also to her, you know, when the time is right. So you have to build this community, this ecosystem of support, uh, around you. you know, on my lowest days when I was going through, um, you know, a time when I was making a few decisions professionally, I reached out to an ecosystem of fellow entrepreneurs as well mm. to guide me, you know, to have that conversation with you to just unburden me. Mm. So I think you need to build that, you to invest in yourself, you to invest in that ecosystem of support. Many times I think we become very insular after motherhood. Very true. I think it's important to get out there and continue building and, you know, that helps you I think discover sources of support that you never even knew you had. Yeah. Yeah. I, so beautifully said, I think uh, whether you're in a leadership position, whether you're talking of that situation or as an entrepreneur, as a mom or in any condition, I think to build an ecosystem of people in the similar situation, I think allows you also a sense of comfort to say that I'm not alone in this. Correct. Know? Absolutely. Not, I'm not the only one who's going through it. And I think uh, I am also a very big advocate of building and leveraging networks for this region. I, reason. I think as women, we don't do it so much. Somehow networking is got a, you know, not so positive connotation in our mind. But I think networks can be the wind beneath our wings. 
and uh, very, very well said. And so, Rajita, I just want to uh, add a, a perspective there as well because I fully agree. And I, 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 you know, I think again for me, it's not about maybe networks per se. It's more about relationships. Yeah, you know, um, and honestly, like if I, it's also about that that chemistry, that vibe, you know. Yeah. So yeah. if if I'm meeting someone for the like the way I met you. Right, we met at Bangalore Airport of all places. Right, we just got talking and we stayed in touch, and it's been always just such a joy. I look forward to always having our conversations. Right, but I've never thought about it from a perspective. Oh, how will, for instance, Rajita ever help or enhance my professional journey? It's always been like there's so much to learn from Rajita's amazing experiences. Right, and you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a moment of joy when I'm interacting with her. Right, I want to continue that relationship. So we both invest. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I think, but if I hadn't even put, if I have, if I hadn't even reached out to you in Bangalore Airport to find out who you were, yeah, right, or hadn't like reciprocated, we would yeah. never even have this bond. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You step out there, and you know, sometimes you will meet amazing people, and sometimes you will not. But the more important thing is to constantly give back absolutely. into the relationship. Absolutely. Versus only taking, taking, taking. Absolutely. Uh, meet your neighbors. I, I mentioned meet... also in that sense. Uh, Correct. I didn't mean it in a very. Uh, uh, transactional, yes. transactional sense I, for me also I think and for all of us I think again I will give the context of COVID I think for a lot of us it has become about building meaningful deep relationships you know um, where you're not just frittering away your time and energy in shallow conversations or shallow interactions but um, meaningful deep relationships I, very very beautifully said Naya and you spoke about Sandeep quite a bit your husband I want to ask you how do you see men um, as uh, allies partners I mean you spoke a lot about it personally but in a professional context uh, as allies of women in leadership um, how, how has been your experience what are your how do you think about it I mean I, I it's absolutely critical I mean, you know, we are 50% or whatever of the world, right? If the other 50% is not with us, then how are we going to get to peak potential or meet our aspirations or ambitions, right? It's impossible. Yeah. You can't, like, you can't just live in an echo chamber and, you know, just, and I think that's why, um, you know, having just gone through my journey of life as well and sort of seeing my mother's journey, seeing successful people's journeys, right? Um, for me, it's always been about building allies, you know, versus saying, oh, it's us against the men. No, it's not about that. We're all in this journey together. And men are going through so much themselves, Rajita, at this point in time. I mean, this so it's a very confusing time for a lot of men, right? Yeah. Having to re-examine some beliefs that maybe were passed on from different generations or having to re-examine their roles uh, in a nuclear setting or, you know, kind of coming to terms with uh, what it means to, you know, be with really powerful women, you know, and, and, and respecting that or, you know, I mean, so many pieces to this, right? So I think men of, I, I think of men as allies. And I think what I have personally found is amazing men. Let me tell you the story, right? When I was going through my transaction, uh, when we were looking and merging with uh, my glam at that point in time, right? Um, and of course, there was another conversation we were doing um, with another, with a set of internals and external investors on uh, putting another round of infusion into baby chakra. And it was a very confusing time. Obviously, like there's a lot of paperwork, you know, lawyer conversations, uh, you know, setting of context with different shareholders. It's a lot of very confusing time, right? I had one of my first not to check on his shareholding and what's going to happen of it, but to check on me. Wow. How are you doing, Naya? I'm just calling him to check on you. I'm here. You know, every morning at 8 a.m. without fail, his name is Karan Maheshwari. He's obviously a very dear friend as well now. But every morning, 8 a.m. without fail. Wow. There was an investor, Arihan Patni, who again said, Naya, you take the decision that you believe is right for the company and for the team. Right. And of course, I try to create a very objective parameter, <laughs> you know, saying like with the time cut off, etc. But again, you know, for my shareholders, a lot of whom were men. To have that very distinct belief in me, I think is amazing. So I have had amazing male allies in my life, you know, professionally. Today, Darpan, who's our group founder, right? He's the one who reached out to me saying, Naya, I want you to join me as co-founder. You know, so you find amazing men in your journey uh, at home, in the workplace. It's about acknowledging them and knowing that they exist. Yeah. And then, of course, partnering with them effectively. Yeah, yeah. Well said, and I think um, we should uh, 
we should seek such partnerships also. As you we were talking before, uh, I think it's both ways. Uh, many times uh, I have seen that women build a wall among, around themselves of some kind, which kind of puts that distance. But I think if we are open and I think we are, we seek it out. Very true. Very true. You were talking about this time, Anaya, when you were selling out. And do you ever feel alone? I mean, very often. Yeah. Of course. Yes. You know, and I think it's normal because eventually... It is honestly, this is the person I'm going to live the rest of my life with, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's me. And there are times when you, um, you know, you're trying to understand or share a perspective that maybe you're not able to articulate it as effectively, and hence people don't understand. And you feel alone at, the, at those times, right? You're making a very big decision. And, you know, especially in Devi Chakra, I remember, because I had no co-founder. It was a very lonely journey. I had an amazing team. Uh, amazing team of leaders, but not everything can obviously be shared with, uh, mm. you know, with everybody at every point in time, right? So there are times when you feel alone uh, and that's natural for any human being. Mm. Um, also, I, however, I do enjoy sometimes that feeling of, of feeling alone because, you know, I'm in that very, like I did my MBTI in McKinsey, right? And I think I've probably evolved a little bit since then. I was very E, you know, okay. the extrovert <laughs> at, okay. at McKinsey, but I feel like today I'm at the cusp between I and E, okay. where I also take solace and I also take strength when I'm alone with myself to collect my thoughts, to calm myself down in stressful times, to mm. build a reservoir of strength, to introspect, right? Mm. Because that gives me clarity of thought for the next day or for what I, how I want to not just live, you know, hour by hour, day by day, but how I want to live the next five years of my life. So I think there is something to be said about uh, not just the sense of loneliness, but also taking out the time to be alone with yourself. Hmm. Two different things. Yes. Yes. Two different, Two different things. things. But in some sense, at some yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, very well said. Um, as you know, when in, in our university, meditation is a, sort of a foundational way of life. And uh, we all meditate, we meditate together and we encourage our students, we've created this ecosystem because that few 10, 12, 15 minutes to yourself, I think, and you know, it's like um, the deeper your connection with yourself, the higher you can go uh, in life. You no, know? like when you throw, when you shoot an arrow, the, the more you pull it back, the more further it goes. Beautiful. That's a beautiful analogy. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's, uh, I, I think it resonates with us. And I think it's also important for other entrepreneurs who are listening to us today, because I think to recognize that those moments when you feel by yourself in a situation need not necessarily be moments of weakness. They can be, they can become moments of strength for us. I think right. that's, that's that's Beautifully what you said. I love the analogy of the arrow, by the way, and I couldn't I couldn't resonate more with it. Yeah, yeah. exactly what I do. You know, when I'm feeling uh, when I'm feeling like I need to make a really important decision, or when I'm feeling at my lowest, I think that's when I take a step back, and I kind of get into myself, and I really give it that deep. I, I haven't unfortunately picked up meditation yet, Rajita. That's been one of my goals. That when up. you come to our campus, we will make <laughs> sure. <laughs> Done. Done. Yeah, no, this is great. So Nayan, one more topic, which is also, you know, uh, something which we are um, uh, doing a lot to support our women uh, startup founders is the whole topic of access to funding. Um, uh, it is popularly believed, the data also shows it, that women have uh, lesser access to funding than men. What has been your whole experience and what sort of practical advice can you give some of our women uh, 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 founders who are listening to this on how they can improve their chances of uh, getting um, access to to bet to funding and to you know uh, to move ahead so i'm going to start off with the basics right i think nothing succeeds like success so i mean don't just count on funding to be the uh, the trust for your company um, mm -hmm. the best situation and a mentor and i'm also an angel investor in a bunch of companies now many of them women led um I basically tell them that you should be in a position where people reach out to you because they're seeing insane traction. Hmm. And they're like, how do I become part of this? Hmm. So kind of switching the narrative from saying we're seeking funding to saying you want to be a part of our company. Oh, well said. Hmm. So 
uh, I think just go at it. And I think many models today don't really, I mean, if you if you want to raise seed capital, I mean, friends and family is a great starting option to get you that initial trust or propulsion, right? And then you just do it. You know, I'll give you another example. We, uh, I, I, I invited uh, Arti, who's a friend, Arti Gale, who sold up for Ziva, right, to Unilever recently to the Mompreneur Legends podcast. And I really want to ask her, like, how, because she did led all the funding efforts for Oziva. And what she told me was interesting. She said, you know, we started off with 25 lakhs, um, which was like family, friends, personal capital. And she grew to 25 crores. And that's when all the investors started reaching out to her. Hmm. You know, so I think keep on pushing and just succeed at some level because then success, you know, everybody wants to be part of a success. A, a, you know a, a successful story one number two you know you know take off this mental block of I, I think times have changed a lot um you know people are realizing that the next growth uh lever is going to come from women um you know being part of the economy or cons you know women consumers etc so a lot of women founders naturally also end up building for themselves so for women right and i think you find a lot more investors interested in that narrative today um and i think so the the, the tailwinds are all there for you to succeed today when you go out to pitch right so you know be very very cognizant that you actually have the whole economy kind of backing you you know so go in with a lot of uh, power especially if you're building for other women mm -hmm. uh, i think it's a great great time to build for women as a woman founder uh, you know your consumers best. But even if you're building in something which is maybe not uh, traditionally, maybe it's not for women, but maybe it's something that you really believe in, right? I think going there without this whole sort of overhang of saying, oh, I'm a woman, the stats are against me, I will not get funding. Just go in there, you know, share your story with authenticity. Don't try and reframe stories based on what the investor's hypothesis there is. Don't waste your time with an investor who does not share the hypothesis that you're based, you know, building your uh, company on. Just mm -hmm. choose your investors well, have the conversations with them and be smart about who you're reaching out to at what point in time, right? Mm -hmm. If you're reaching out to, let's say, a private equity fund at a, you know, at an at this angel stage, you're not going to get that money, you know? So a lot of evangelism also needs to be done with, I think, early stage founders on where the different kinds of risk capital also come in and who mm -hmm. are the right partners to choose based on their hypotheses, based on their investment patterns, their trends, uh, the funds, uh, you know, um, gestation period, etc. So, uspa mm -hmm. evangelism abhi chahiye hota hai, Rajita. And I think that's where like these conversations will help. Um, I think the third piece is like obviously like just have all your um, your numbers, your data, your uh, you know, be very convinced on the growth pattern that you're going in with. Because see, investors who are coming in to fund you mm -hmm. are coming in to fund you on two things. One is that very early stage of funding you as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. your track record of success on something you've done. Uh, or they're coming in to basically say that this 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 team has an insight that no one else does. Hmm. Right? So you have to go in with the data, the facts to basically back both of these pieces, right? That as an entrepreneur, you're able to build something that no one else can build but you and your team. And number two, that we have the insight. So we have a certain leverage in the market that no one else does. And that can be usually backed by very strong examples of product market fit, of scale that is organically happening mm -hmm. or of, you know, uh, uh, you know, deals that you're doing with, let's say, customers with a SaaS company that, you know, that have amazing deals to crack and you've reached mm -hmm. a certain level of traction with them. Wow, this is amazing. I have, have a small request for you that you should uh, uh, really create a sort of a one, two hour masterclass on some of these exactly what you were saying now because I find that there is a lot of asymmetry of information or understanding amongst startup founders and especially amongst women founders and uh, I think this will really really help uh, because uh, I think that there is a huge marketplace today which is available and which is ready to invest to fund and there is a huge pool of um, people with really fabulous ideas but somewhere that match is not happening or the understanding of how to match is not so clear so that is a small request in your busy schedule if you can really create something like this i think you would do a huge service to a big 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 network uh you know of uh of startup uh, early stage founders that that kind those kind of people like in our uh incubator most of them are early stage startups and that is our effort to bring them along the whole 
uh, value chain and to you know really get them to move ahead and uh, these kind of uh, interventions inputs will be very very valuable very well said very well said naya so i want to um, come to the topic of you know i mean you are a woman um, your uh, your passion has been in this field also so do you do anything intentional anything specific to um, to ensure uh, sort of gender parity or inclusion diversity of all kinds uh, is there anything you do intentionally or how does it work in 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 your group no i'm fairly intentional yes i am uh, and i and it has to start from all of us uh, to be intentional about things um, right from the language we use in team rooms right uh, and what i mean there is that um, uh, you know when you're talking in, and uh, I, i mean i have so many examples from the monprano podcast but you know i think this uh, and you must see this episode with neelu you know that i think you'll really re resonate because you know she talks about how she was the first woman officer in in, in ladakh in kargil sorry in kargil um and uh, you know the 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 commander would come in and basically say good morning officer gentlemen and neelu or good morning officers and neelu so she went up to him offline and said you know don't do that don't single me out and he was like but what do i call you he's like just say good morning officers hmm wow you know? yeah <laughs> it's a powerful example and I, similar right i mean i think i used to go in and say hey guys you yeah. know oh, like hello folks is a great gender neutral way to address the men and women in your room or what's up team right not what's up guys i mean something so simple and you know something but it makes a difference it mm. does right so i think first you to start checking the language we use Mm. in our scenarios in our offices in our communications you know today also from my uh, if i get communication from my kid school that says hello mrs rao when i'm actually sagi right mm. it's going to be like and if my husband wrote on top of that to them first and did not address back saying hello parent or hello mr rao but assuming the mother is always writing in you know mm. it makes you feel that something's off right so mm. first is that it starts with that language you use right that's very important so constantly i'm also learning you know we are all learning in this together so we're trying to check our language and ensure mm. it's extremely inclusive mm. and, and as neutral as possible the second thing of course is um, you know celebrating the stories of the women who are doing the best to make it you know mm. we talk about again i go back i come from a place of definite privilege right because i have already a very supportive husband i mean supportive when he's playing his role so you know we're we're supporting each other but there are people in mid management in you know um, uh, folks who are maybe in the warehouse right who are women who are mothers and how they manage yeah it's a different story i have a nanny you know i have staff rajita yeah. i'm very privileged and very fortunate yeah but their story so those stories need to come out and be told and also the team is be socialized to the the effort that they are putting in to make it work work for them yeah yeah so i think that's the other conscious like very very uh, determined effort we all do right to bring out their stories i think the third piece of course evangelizing the men as well yeah you know so what we end up doing is a lot of i mean of course apart from the workshopping you know like the unconscious bias bias you know all the other stuff the workshopping there but i think important for men to also see it play out practically and the good thing is the glam group actually has a lot of women in mm. leadership so the two group co-founders priyanka and i are women right our ceo of brand so clean is a woman right we have uh, disha who heads our new product development she's a director on the board as well so she's a woman mm. you know malini so we have about i think 50% women in our cxxos right uh, and then of course in the group itself we have 65% women so wow. men see that actively right so you just don't have to talk you actually see it play out in the way the group shapes out hmm. who you're interacting with on a day to day basis hmm. so i think that's a very determined effort you don't get to this kind of a ratio without you know very very clear effort to ensure that you're recruiting more women or you're not looking at a uh, you know you're not asking questions of women when they're uh, you know applying to you that makes them feel like they're less or they're not as worthy hmm hmm very well said very well said and i think um uh, i also look at it like this that those of us as women in positions of influence uh, have a bigger responsibility to ensure that in that intentionality cascades and you know it translates 
into whether it's policies or uh, you know other such um, other such ways that creates a more facilitative ecosystem for women to kind of even continue in, in the professional uh, journey of their life actually these days naya that's a big challenge you know in fact uh, uh, the karnataka government has a women at work uh, program as part of the Karnataka Digital Economy Mission. I'm on the council, executive council, which has been constituted only to create a facilitative environment to bring women back to work. Those who, you know, fell out of work during COVID reasons like childbirth or elder care, etc. What we can do to bring them back. So I think that has also become a very important um, uh, area that we need to focus on um in our country for sure and and you know rajita i i i, I love the uh, the mission of this particular initiative and i think it goes back to saying you know like like with health you know yeah. or you uh, become unwell is there a way to not even have that disease in the first place preventive yeah preventive right yeah. and i think that's where it's really important for all of us as leaders and as uh, in the government as well as corporates to basically say, can we ensure that when women have to take the time that they need, right, for let's say whatever caregiving responsibilities that might fall on their shoulders alone in many cases yeah. still, yeah. Right? can it be a comma and not a full stop? Right. Well said. Well said. Can we do things like sabbaticals? Can we do something like where they continue on a part-time role, a more flexible role? I mean, there's so many alternatives today. Yeah. So I just don't leave it because once you leave, then to come back to build the equations and networks you talked about, yeah. right? Yeah. The killing the reskilling. Yeah. It's really tough. The lack of confidence, more importantly. You know, you have amazing, amazing women who've left and they're so unconfident about coming back to the workforce because they're like, I just don't know how I do it, like how I present myself in a meeting. It's been such a big time. And and actually, in some organizations, I have seen that there are sabbaticals, but they are viewed with so much prejudice already that, oh, if you could take a sabbatical and if the role continued, then you probably are not needed in that role kind of a mindset. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, women, even men are so sort of apprehensive to take a sabbatical because you are so, uh, you know, you, you feel insecure about whether your position is secure then. So I think uh, there is a lot of uh, openness of actual practical implementation approach that we all uh, need to have about this. And can I just add one more perspective here? Yeah. You know, um, I was sharing this on a panel I was at recently and someone was, you know, we were talking about how um, cooking and caregiving, etc. You know, so I, I genuinely feel because we grew up in a paradigm and the world was shaped by a paradigm that was so male narrative oriented, right? And these duties were traditionally uh, at some point taken on by women and there weren't any financial implications to this, right? We sort of went as a society and kind of disparaged caregiving. Yeah. We diminished the role of taking care of children or, you know, providing nutritious meals at home, Right. Because the narrative was shaped by men, there was no financial attribution to those activities. I think it's super important to actually bring as, um, as an environment, as an ecosystem, respect back to those activities. And when you bring respect back, it's also important to basically have men, you know, um, be play those roles, of course. But if you bring respect back, then if a man is taking time out, or whatever time he needs for caregiving or for elder care or to cook meals for his children or family or to go out and pick his children, right? Then he is also actively encouraged in the ecosystem he operates in. You know, we have this whole initiative at Baby Chakra called Equal Parent, mm -hmm. right? Where we did a survey. This is 2018 I'm talking about. We did a survey across uh, 25 top corporates. So across, I think, 10, 15,000 men. And they all want to play a role in being an equal partner. But, you know, at the workplace, if you're stepping out or if you're taking a paternity break, right, you're looked at very differently. Yeah, yeah. So you have to change the entire perspective because if you change it, then men will start playing an equal part at home. Women will be supported, right, and will get the time to play their roles as well. And we're, we're good. Absolutely, absolutely. You're absolutely right. If there is no stigma associated with the fact that you took a paternity leave, there may be a paternity leave, but if you took it, then, you know, there is still a sort of unspoken 
um, there might be an unspoken bias. I have seen it in some cases. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Naya, can I ask you a few like uh, three tip kind of questions? Sure. Yeah. So um, three things that you are really super proud about the company you you built and where you are. Three things. Um, so I think at the, at the group and at Baby Chakra both, um, what I'm really proud about is that we're doing things um, in a way where we're also looking very closely at the impact we are creating. I think that's really important, you know, as entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs building in India, whatever work we do has an impact in society and with people that we serve, right? Um, and I am really proud, for instance, you know, of course, the Baby Chakra, we were, we've were always been in service of mothers, but now with the Moms Co and with Good Land Group doing the initiatives we are with, you know, we're launching this whole mom micro entrepreneur support initiative, right? We're putting in seed funding. We're bringing in an amazing panel of top leaders who are mothers, right? To support them and to advise them and mentor them. And we're sharing the stories across millions of our, uh, you know, uh, consumers. I think that's something that makes me very proud that we're able to do this, mm -hmm. you know? That's one. The second I, I'm very, very proud of is I think the teams we are building, mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, and I say this often, life and entrepreneurship is a people's business. So if you don't have the best teams in place or the right minded teams in place, right, you're not going to get very far. And all the success, all the efforts that I, I genuinely attribute both at Baby Chakra and at the Good Lamb Group are completely because of the team literally Rajata and I don't say it as one of those typical statements right it's really because of the team in my lowest moments you know when we were maybe we you know COVID right when term sheets were pulled and we had no money and you know to see the team step up and say we will take salary cuts or we will not take our salaries hmm. to support me in that journey it stays with me as a founder <laughs> so I think it's a lot that we have to be grateful to our teams for right and it's a team sport that we are all playing and it makes me very proud to see the teams and how mission driven they are. I think the third thing that makes me very proud is, um, I think the, um, you know, the fact that we're able to have this dream, which honestly, maybe even a year back would have seemed audacious mm -hmm. of being um, a company that will be one of the first companies from India to go global. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the first young ventures from India to go global in a very, very, very meaningful way. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think it goes back to that entire root of that vision that we had, even when we we're building our baby chakra from our dining table, right? Can we build companies that are made in India, but made for the world? Mm. And I see that play out with the Good Lamb Group today. So I'm super excited about it. And we're able to take audacious bets. We're the first to launch uh, across the world you know, really large, highly deep trust brand communities. Mm. It's not existing. It does not exist before. Mm. You know, maybe a few people have tried it out at different scales, right? Like Xiaomi or, or Nothing or Lego or, you know, Harley Davidson. But we've never really done it at a concerted, scientific, product-based, data-backed manner mm. at the scale we have, right? So we've taken these bets, I think, at the group mm. uh, and with our quest to be global and be a global major out of India. Mm -hmm. that I think are for the first time being done globally. <laughs> wow. Wow. Awesome. Three things. So a lot of 17, 18 year olds to about 23, 24 year olds are watching you. Um, what, what advice would you give them? One, two, three, any number? Um, it's, it's never too early to start. That's one. Mm -hmm. Even in law school, and this was a different generation altogether, right? I was doing side projects because my pocket money was all of like 3000 rupees a month. Right? Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to like have maybe a better meal or, you know, get out or do something fun. And I remember taking on, you know, side jobs, side hustles. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was a lawyer who'd send me drafts to transcribe and I'd sit and work, you know, on those. Or I'd start like a little business in <laughs> college campus or even in school, honestly, I used to sell these little dolls I would make. So it's never too early to start, you know. I mean, it and the feeling of empowerment being financially independent gives you it's unbeatable mm. beatable so don't wait for your degrees and to wait for everything to start like start while you're doing your degree there's enough ways to make money on the side and in that journey you'll learn very valuable life skills how to be professional how to deliver on time how to stick to your promises how to be your own personal brand 
mm. right? And what you stand for. That's one. Um, number two, um, you know, learn to give back. Mm. Um, when you're building friendships, when you're building relationships, uh, when you're, you know, with your family, with your friends, uh, with anyone you're interning with in time, right? Learn to give back because eventually that's what life is about. <laughs> you know, you have to not just take, 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 take because you can't. I mean, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, you have absolutely. to give back and you have to make a conscious effort to give back. And, you know, it won't be like someone will tell you, I need this from you, maybe all the time. You have to find opportunities, but maybe someone needed something from you that you can contribute to or needed something that you can contribute to and mm -hmm. actively give it. In fact, that is one of the most beautiful ways to give back. Mm -hmm. It's expected of you. So yeah. learn to give back, right? And watch out. And I think the third piece is watch out for people mm -hmm. in a positive way. Like if someone is struggling, you know, there might be a classmate, there might be someone you're working with, there might be a team member, family member, maybe someone at home, maybe they're struggling with something. Mm. So when people are the lowest low, that's when you need to be there with them. Uh, mm. And, you know, it, and don't go in with the expectation of anybody ever giving anything back, but mm. be with people, watch out for people, watch out for your team, watch out for your family, you know, because those things elevate you in ways that you don't even realize happen. Right. And people are then watching out for you in return. Yeah. And you don't know it's happening. And that's a very, very big gift. Yeah. So definitely watch out for people. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. What in your book, Naya, are uh, like the two, three top skills graduating students need to have? One is um, stick to your commitments. Because when you commit something, you should absolutely hold yourself accountable for delivering on it. And therefore that means, that might mean make saying no more no's than saying yeses in some cases. But when you do say yes, make it happen. Right. Um, the second is learn that in this journey of life, you are your, you're a brand, hmm. right? And what do you stand for needs to be stuff that comes authentically to who you are. Then don't try and force fit yourself into, there's so much noise on social media, so much noise with peer pressure, et cetera, right? You know, go deep, understand what you stand for, what matters most to you and why. And then that becomes your personal brand because then whatever you do should kind of reflect that, okay. right? Um, and I think the third piece I'd say is that, um, you know, don't get swayed by people's journeys. Even this journey I'm recounting to you is my journey, mm. right? It's not a perfect journey. It may not be like, go, go with your own journey in mind. You're crafting out your own journey. Um, you know, keep at it. Don't let the lows really discourage you because just know that those are transient. Don't let the highs also sway you. Those are also transient. Mm. Uh, so just go on your own journey and know that you're playing the long game. So, you know, go through it with whatever level of equanimity you can muster. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, be realistic about your successes and be realistic about your failures. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. What advice would you give Naya to, um, those who are fence sitters that they're thinking, okay, should I start my own enterprise or, you know, they are on the fence. They are, they are open to it, but not yet having the sort of courage to take the plunge. What, what would you, talk, because I see a lot of fence sitters. So what would you say to them? I'd say it's your journey. You know, uh, earlier I would have said, oh, just start up now. Start. But, you know, honestly, it is a lot of emotional, a lot of financial commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not an easy decision to make. So if you're not mentally ready mm -hmm. and if your ecosystem is not there to support you in that decision today or you have to still think about whether you have an ecosystem to support you, you know, because financially it may not be the best decision for you to make in the next couple of years, mm -hmm. first two years, three years, right? When you're setting up business, then don't do it. Genuinely don't do it. Hmm. But if you feel that, yes, this is the right decision for me. I am mentally ready. I have figured out how I will make some, build something out for the next five, 10 years of my life. And that I'm ready for that commitment, you know, and you also have, after testing it a lot, a very unique insight into what difference you will create with the business you're out to build and how big that can be for you. Then do it. Hmm. If you're a fence sitter, and you've chosen to be a fence sitter, right? You're not sitting on the fence because someone put you there. You're sitting there because you chose to be there. Mm. So maybe just introspect a little bit on as to why you're there mm. and what would move you to the other side either way. 
Wow. Well said, well said, well said. So what about those who have, uh, because we have a lot, lot of startups which are very early stage. Um, now you have gone, you have become a unicorn. So what would you say to some of them? Few things to keep in mind. So I'd say like, uh, and I, Rajita, thank you for saying we're a unicorn, but I really think like eventually it's all about like the eventual impact we'll create, you know, the valuation you know, in different markets, could be whatever it is, right? So I, I would strongly say, don't go after, um, you know, don't go chasing tags, mm. right? But understand what is the difference you're making in the lives of your consumers, mm. right? How are you impacting and making their lives better? Mm. You know, because eventually you're building, see entrepreneurship at the heart of it is a service, mm. right? If you don't serve a certain constituent, you have no right to be in business. Right. Right? Wow. So just focus on that consumer and basically say, what am I doing that are exponentially changing their lives or improving their lives? And that's why they have a, I have a right therefore, or they have the, um, they have the willingness mm. to part with money to give me because I'm making their lives better. So just mm. focus on the consumer right now. And number two, focus on your team. Mm. These are the two main constituents you will have. And of course, over time, you will have maybe investors, you'll have shareholders, right? That's a third big constituent you'll have. Mm -hmm. But I think if the first two are in a good place, right? That's the most important piece to entrepreneurs starting out today. And, and by the way, also focus on yourself. Uh, because I feel too many times, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're so caught up with, and we've, we've, you know, I'm someone who's very mission-driven, as you, as you know, Rajita, right? As are you. But I think so many times we are, we're just so focused on building, building, building that oftentimes we forget to just take that step back and take a pause, mm. take a little bit of a mental health rest day. You know, earlier I used to work seven days a week, pretty much like 18, 20 hours a day. I was ridiculous after a bit, right? I realized I have to take Sundays off. So I put my phones off on Sunday. I try not to attend to anything as much as possible. So I had that one day properly to myself and to mm. my family. So take that time off for yourself. That's the fourth big constituent that you have. And honestly, if you're not, investing in yourself, then you, the first three constituents don't get any, any of that benefit. That's true. That's true. Now, you know, what, what keeps you awake at night and what makes you wake up with excitement? I wake up with excitement every day. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's super exciting. Even in most challenging days, right. And I'm awake whole night. I'm like, chalo, aad solve ho jayega. <laughs> so I'm wow, so optimistic. Wow. Wow. I'm quite an optimist, Rajita, and I don't know if that, I, I don't know, that's how I am. You are making it sound very easy. I know it won't be that easy. No, it's not, obviously, but I, I do think, uh, you know, I'm excited about what I'm building, what we're building. I love what we do. I am so grateful for everything, the opportunities I've had. You know, so I'm very grateful in general, and I'm very excited about what I'm building. And of course, there's a long way to go still. So I think that's what keeps me on my toes. Mm. And I and that's what keeps me awake at night as well, to some extent, right? Of course, like there are times when I'm awake at night because, oh, you know, there's some there's a people's issue or there's like a, you know, like maybe someone decided to move on and you're like, oh God, you know, what did I, what could I have done differently to retain that person? Because I mean, at the heart of it, like I'm very, very team first, right? So for me, you know, you often wonder how can you be doing better as a leader? And there's a lot I've learned still. So those things keep me awake at night. Hmm. Uh, but apart from that I'm very grateful I'm just excited about what I'm doing and I'm very grateful I have the opportunity to do what I really love doing mm -hmm. well, beautiful you know uh, it is said also in our Vedic texts that the more grateful we are the more grace and blessing flows in our life so uh, that is the that is a secret that we need to be able to unlock and, uh, you know, Gurudev always says, uh, Naya, that when you have a very, very, when you keep a very, very big goal in life, then the small challenges that are there as part of that journey, they become in a way inconsequential or nothing difficult to overcome. But if the goal is small, then they look too big. So uh, he's, he always says, if you want to worry, worry about climate change. So what can I do for climate change? Then that is a big worry to have and it will elevate you to a higher level of action and thinking. So I think very beautifully said. Some fun questions, Naya? Sure. Yeah. So Calcutta or Mumbai? Mumbai. Mumbai? Okay. Uh, Puchka of Calcutta or Pani Puri of Mumbai? Yeah. 
हंड्रेड परसेंट ओके बॉस्टन फॉल और मुंबई मॉनसून बॉस्टन फॉल बॉस्टन फॉल नॉट मुंबई मॉनसून ओके in the air that i miss still and you know having my hot chocolate there is a joy to that there is a joy to that yeah 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 okay mountains with arya or beach beaches beaches okay um uh, working saturday or uh, holiday saturday depends on the work i'm doing <laughs> but i love doing some of the stuff we do on saturdays we do a lot of uh, shoots we do a lot of con- conversations with customers so it's a beautiful way to also spend saturdays okay okay um uh, what can i ask you more this i didn't plan so this is you <laughs> but i like where it's going because <laughs> food hands down i'm so sorry but food hands down calcutta will win any time yeah 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 <laughs> um okay indian clothing or western 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 do you wear sarees naya i'm not very graceful okay <laughs> <laughs> okay if uh, uh, not if when naya writes a book what might it be called um i think the cel- like it'll be about i don't know what it'll be called but it'll be celebrating the many stories of the amazing communities i've had the privilege to interact with some amazing inspiring stories of of women of mothers of entrepreneurs male and female i've had a chance to kind of see first hand i'd love to write the stories out wow what what is the one word that comes to your mind when you think india amazing okay women brilliant resilient okay entrepreneurs hard work education nation building nation building youth the future <laughs> and the future amazing <laughs> <laughs> i think we come a full circle naya it's been uh, we've been chatting for over an hour and yes we have and uh, you you some of i mean all of the insights you shared with us from your life and how you have um, uh, how you have navigated your professional journey i think it's it's really really valuable and i'm sure everybody who is listening to this will have many many lessons to derive so i want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of the entire university team for giving us this time despite your really really busy uh, schedule and specifically this time when you have some very important launches thank you very 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 much you are very kind rajatan it's a real honor and a real privilege to be talking to you as you know and i'm a big fan of yours so thank <laughs> you so much thank you for having me we are awaiting your visit to our campus uh, i know well, i have... come and see the tree yes so what tree would you like planted naya is there a possibility to having a mango tree yes yes we have a mango orchard already 2 years ago we uh, we farmed 3000 kilos of mangoes wow because my mother absolutely loves mango so in a okay. way it's something i tell her she'll be very happy about we will plant a mango tree and we will send you a picture oh, of wonderful. that thank you, you know? so wonderful thank you thank you all right thanks thanks rajita